Good afternoon. Good, <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you. I'm so excited today for all of you because I get to introduce two people who I greatly admire. And also I consider my friends, Michael and Katie Stoller. Michael, um, while he was working on Wall Street, observed the differences in the cultures of the various organizations he worked with and how some of them really negatively impacted morale, and which led him to ask, is there really a best culture? So in 2002, he left Wall Street to research organizational culture in depth, in depth, ultimately writing two books, Fired Up and or Burned Out and The Connection Culture. And that's how I kind of got connected with him because I read Fired Up or Burned Out and I really liked it. Michael has spoken about leadership and organizational culture at a wide variety of organizations, including Costco, Google, Memorial Sloan Kettering, NASA, Northwestern Medicine, Qualcomm, Turner Construction, and the Yale New Haven Health System. He's co-founder and consultant to the TCU Center for Connection. Katie is a partner in the Connection Culture Group and a gifted connector herself. She's a speaker and a teacher. Audiences and seminar participants enjoy her sense of humor and her practical advice element. She's comfortable in front of people and she's been singing, I didn't realize this, in a cappella groups for more than 24 years. Yes. She's also done a little bit, and I knew this part, of TV and film work. A surprising piece of her story, I, and I would say this is her resiliency, is that she's a three-time cancer survivor. And boy, that's amazing, Katie. And that's so admirable. Katie's also a contributor to Connection Culture and has co-authored articles that have appeared in Leader to Leader and the HR Magazine. Professionally, Katie brings diverse experiences in marketing, administration, communications, business, and nonprofit organizations to her role. She also has extensive experience volunteering and serving on boards of several social sector and educational organizations. Michael and Katie reside in Greenwich, Connecticut, and it looks cold behind you there today. It is. It's, oh. it's cold and snowy. Their two grown daughters, of course, my favorite part of their family, and their son-in-law are all TC alums, and their granddaughter is a member of the class of 2040 at TCU. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Katie and Michael Stoller. Thanks for being with us. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank, thank you, you, Chancellor. Well, I I'm wondering, is anyone during the pandemic feeling stress? Anyone? Yeah, I'm feeling stress. <laughs> so, well, you're not alone. Uh, research shows that eight out of 10 Americans report that during the coronavirus pandemic, it's a significant source of stress in their lives. And it is for me too. I've, I've felt that. Um, we, you know, for, for me, this is not the most stressful time that I've experienced in my life. And the chancellor referenced an event uh, about Katie's uh, health that was the most stressful time in our lives. And um, during that time, Katie was, uh, early on, she was diagnosed with two types of cancer within a year. And her chance of survival was less than 10%. This was, you know, as you can imagine, that was uh, a time where I felt I was extremely uh, stressed and worried about losing my beloved best friend about Katie uh, not seeing her girls who were just 12 and 10 grow up and our daughters losing this really wonderful mother. And it was a time where I experienced loneliness and anxiety more than I had ever experienced in my life. And I had uh, set aside my work for a while because I knew we had a battle ahead and wanted to focus on helping Katie. And it was during that time that we had family, friends, people in our community, our healthcare workers that uh, people we worked with at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and Yale Health that uh, supported us. And it was a time that was rich in relationships and connection. And it had a profound effect on me. It was an epiphany in my life. And there were two things in particular that I noticed. Number one, that those connections, those relationships, they helped helped calm my anxiety, reduce my anxiety so that I felt better. And secondly, I also, it helped me be more optimistic that we were going to get Katie through this difficult season ahead. And last month, 
we celebrated Katie's 16th year of being cancer-free from advanced ovarian cancer. Now, she has had one other uh, type of cancer, uh, breast cancer, uh, but she's in the clear, and the outlook is, is good. So um, th that experience really opened my eyes to the power of connection. And that's what we're going to talk about today, that connection is, it's a, I think of it as a superpower that makes us smarter, happier, and more productive. It also helps us cope in times of adversity, and dare I say, even thrive through times of adversity. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And in the time we have together, we're going to share uh, practices that you can put in place that'll help you, that you can share with others that, you know, loved ones and friends. We're going to talk about a little bit about the science of connection and research. We're going to break into small groups where you get a chance to kind of process the content that we're sharing. And we have uh, a self-assessment self exercise that Katie is going to take you through. So let me share this um, presentation. Now, let's see if we can do this. Hang on a second here. Okay. You should see this in just a second. There we go. All right. So here's our agenda during the time we have. First, we're going to talk about the connection just in the context of the pandemic. That's on everyone's mind. And there's some very relevant things we can share there. Then we're going to move into why connection is a superpower and get into a little bit of the science and uh, hopefully share some things that you're not aware of that uh, will help you see just how powerful connection is and how um, you know, problematic disconnection is in life. And then we'll get into some practices, connection in your daily life. And then we'll even look ahead to after the pandemic. You know, what about after the pandemic? What, what should we be thinking about a connection in that context? So we'll share that. So let's, let's get started. You know, when I saw this image, it really struck me that it's, it, it visually represents kind of the situation we're in now, that we have these clouds, we feel the stress of the pandemic weighing on us. Um, and yet, realistically, when we look ahead, there are some things to be optimistic about. And I think it's important, our mindset's important. And so some things to be optimistic about are, uh, number one, just the vaccines that have been developed. And I, I looked it up, I have the numbers right in front of me, I looked it up this morning. And um, the COVID vaccine, we have, right now we have four COVID vaccines that have been approved and are presently being administered. We have six that are in early or limited use and in the pipeline for clinical trials on humans. So these are currently being uh, tested on humans. We have another 67 vaccines in the pipeline. So it is what has happened during this time is there has been a, a phenomenal amount of money, resources, and scientific talent concentrated on solving this problem of the coronavirus. And so what we're seeing, our new methods are being um, developed to create vaccines on, on a shorter time frame. In fact, you know, before it took as long as four years, earliest is four years, but now, you know, the two vaccines that are presently in use in the U.S. were developed in 11 months, which is astounding. So there are breakthroughs that are happening that are going to improve our quality of life after, during the pandemic and after the pandemic. And that's something to be optimistic about. Secondly, the healthcare workers on the front lines have been innovative in in um, developing therapies that help improve the outcomes of COVID patients. And that's something to be optimistic about. So when we look ahead, we can see that there's sunlight out there. You know, the clouds are, are closest to us because we're in the midst of this pandemic and we still have a lot of people who are suffering during this time. But the end is in sight with all the vaccines that are being developed. It's gonna take a time, time because the, these vaccines have to be distributed throughout the world. And so, um, you know, it's something to keep in mind that the future is bright. It's gonna take a while to get through this, but the future is bright. So during the pandemic though, what are some things that we need to know about that'll help us? And the way we see it is that there's been a convergence of three factors that you need to be aware of. Number one, we've talked about stress. Stress was high before the pandemic. It's even higher now that uh, we're in the pandemic. And uh, secondly, 
We have a loneliness epidemic in the US. Um, before the pandemic, research from Cigna, the insurance company, which was the most recent research done, showed that 61% of Americans were tested out as lonely. And so that's a problem. And now we have, because of the pandemic, we have social isolation where we're just connecting and around people less. So that convergence of three factors makes it more likely that we'll be in a state that scientists call stress response. And what happens, our, our body perceives that the environment has changed and that's threatening. And so it, it overallocates blood, glucose, and oxygen to the fight or flight systems, which are the heart, the lungs, the big muscles. And um, it underallocates, it actually takes those resources from other parts of the body, parts of the brain, the digestive system, the immune system, and the reproductive system are short changed. Now, the effect of that is when you're stuck in that state of stress response, as many people are today, because we're worrying about this and we're stressed, it means that we won't feel as well. We won't think as clearly, we won't be as creative, we won't have as much energy. And we have to do things that help counteract the effects of that so that our body moves from the stress response back to a state called homeostasis or balance. So that all the blood, the blood glucose and oxygen is circulating to all the bodily systems at levels that they need to be healthy. Okay, so that's a little bit of context. And that's what we're gonna do today through exercises and some of the practices we share is it'll help you uh, strengthen your emotional health. And that has, an, has implications for your physical health. So next step is we're going to take you through an exercise that we do with a lot of our clients in workshops and in coaching we do. And Katie is going to guide us through that. Katie. Okay. Thank you. Oh, how I wish that we were all together in the same room so I could see all of you. Uh, but here we are connecting as best we can over a screen. All right, so it's year two of this pandemic. You know, last March, we thought it could be a short distance sprint. You know, we're gonna rally, flatten the curve. And here we are still running this long distance marathon that we're in. So if we were together, I would say, how are you doing? What can we do to stand strong you know, as we uh, move toward that finish line that, that's out there now, we can, we can see it out in the distance. Uh, what can we do to stand stronger or at least a little stronger? So let's make this personal. If you uh, downloaded and printed off the handout, this is the time to have that ready. If you don't have it, a uh, piece of paper will work. You can do some simple drawing. And um, as we like to take people through, an exercise, uh, a self-assessment using a diagram of Atlas. You know, when we're coaching people or doing um, a longer workshop. And um, Atlas, as you may know, is this figure from Greek mythology who was condemned to bear the weight of the heavens on his shoulders. And chances are you've seen a depiction of him. Usually old man, beard, he's like hunched over, he's crouching down, sometimes he's barely standing. Now, this particular atlas that you see on the screen uh, stands in Rockefeller Center in Midtown Manhattan, New York City, um, very near the, the ice skating rink and where they put up the giant tree at Christmas time. And I must say, this atlas is looking pretty good. <laughs> He's looking very strong. He's got this handled. So this is the atlas that we want to be, not the one who's about to topple over. So let's look at your handout. Aha. Okay. So here's our atlas. Um, you can see that we've labeled the sphere stress, and we've labeled his legs connection and resilience. So atlas, if the stress becomes so heavy, overwhelming, threatening, and he doesn't have the strength in his legs to hold him up, he's going to collapse. And that's true for you. And that's true for, true for me too. So we need to build up our strength in our legs. So step one in our self-assessment is going to be to think about the stress. Okay. Without getting stressed out about this, what I'd like you to do is around the stress circle, 
jot down some things that feel like burdens. You know, what's the weight that you are carrying on your shoulders right now? And here are some common ones uh, that we see, you know, hear from people when we're doing this self-assessment. These are prompts. Write down what's personal to you. Okay. Workload. Uh, COVID-19, absolutely. Politics, gracious. Um, could be parenting, especially if you are juggling uh, working and your kids are, are um, studying from home. Change, Tra changes, wow, so much change. Mm -hmm. Could be finances, racism, trauma, something about health or relationships. I will be quiet and um, just write down some things. Right. It's so hard for me to know if I need to give you some more time since I can't see all of you, but let's keep moving. And step two is going to be to look at the connection leg. And I'd like you to think about uh, the people or groups in your life that you feel a strong connection to. So if my helper here could advance the slide. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Step two. Um, Write down the names of people, as I was saying, who you feel a connection to could be, you know, here are categories, spouse, partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, family, friends, might be colleagues, uh, groups in the community. Okay, I hope I'm not rushing you. It probably was like five seconds. It felt like a long, longer time. But, you know, keep writing your connection ones. We're going to move to our step three, and that is to fill out the resilience side. So ask yourself, what are the things I do to um, restore my health, uh, restore my energy? And, you know, I forgot to mention something back on the connection side. Um, if it, if it helps you to think about who those people are, you can think about, you know, who has my back, who would I turn to in a, if I were in a difficult situation, you know, who energizes me, who, um, who do I really, really enjoy spending time with? Okay. So that was connection. While you're thinking about resilience, here are some categories to think about sleep or rest, um, diet, you know, what are you eating? What are you drinking? Um, exercise, gratitude, uh, prayer or meditation, mindfulness, uh, creative outlets. You know, maybe you, uh, maybe it's music or dance or art or baking, or, um, you know, maybe it's being outside in nature, getting some sunshine. So I'll give you a little time to write some resilience things down. All right, I'm gonna keep going. I'm sorry if I'm rushing some of you, I don't, I, I wouldn't want to, but so future steps, if my helper could advance the slide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I don't wanna rush you on these next steps. So, uh, because they're ones that I think you wanna spend some time on and reflect on. So I would encourage you to complete this exercise when you've got a little bit more time. And let me just tell you what those steps would be. We would ask you to rate each of the things that you've written down, not rank, but rate. So using a scale of one to 10, with one being low and 10 being high, you know, give each of these things a number. And I hope that 
your stresses are not all nines and tens. That's going to be bad. But, uh, you know, give, give a number one to 10 to each thing. And then the next would be to kind of step back, right? What do you see? You know, what, what are the patterns? What really stands out to you that maybe you need to address soon? Or, you know, what's a low hanging fruit that uh, with a little bit, I could fix this number. Um, drill down and, and try to be a little as specific as you can. So if you said finances, for instance, um, what is it about finances? Is it credit card debt? Is it um, needing to have more in your, you know, rainy day fund, you know, make this personal for you. Now, I want to point out that that top line above the stress, we wrote the word disconnection, and we did that on purpose. And here's why, and we're going to get more into this as we go along um, today. But if you have a lack of sufficient connection, it's going to make the weight the, the pain that you feel from the stress even greater. And if you have a lack of sufficient connection, it's gonna undermine your resilience practices. It's going to affect the quality of your sleep. It's going to affect your self-control when it comes to, am I gonna eat the entire container of Ben and Jerry's or just one scoop? Okay. I'm looking Guilty. at Mike. I'm looking at Mike. Okay. Um, it's also going to, you know, affect your willpower to exercise. So from that standpoint, just, um, connection is this systemic factor that affects the whole system. So zero in on what you can do to boost connection, you know, write down something um, that you can do and then tap into that power of human connection by spending some time with a, a trusted friend or family member and talking about what you learned about this through doing this self-assessment. You know, what's an action that you're going to do? Maybe brainstorm some ideas, ask them to help you be accountable for, you know, carrying things through. So that's the Atlas exercise. Now we're going to pause for the first of our three breakout sessions, because while I didn't give you enough time to complete, thoughtfully complete the Atlas exercise. I do think it's going to be helpful to start to talk about it. And how can we have a connection event without spending time connecting? So, uh, you know, meeting some people you may not have met yet and learning from each other. So here's, let me just say a little bit about these breakout sessions. Um, it's going to be 15 minutes and a shout out to Austin who is our tech person. Thank you, Austin, today is, um, Austin will give you a one minute warning um, so that you know when it's about time for us to, to come back together. And uh, we did not assign group leaders and that's gonna be okay because you all can totally handle this. The topics are pretty straightforward. And um, if you, you may have somebody who's like, yep, I'm gonna go first, jump right in. If you don't, here's a little something you could do. Go around in your group and you will be you know, up to six people and um, introduce yourself and say the month of your birthday. So I'm Katie, uh, I was born in the month of October. And the person whose birthday is closest to today gets to be that lucky person to start first. So there's just a little idea to, to um, pick a person who will start first. So here are your topics. What stood out to you doing this self-assessment? And what is one of your go-to resilience practices? Okay, so off you go. Uh, have a great time chatting. We'll see you uh, in a little bit. Okay, welcome back everyone. In this next section, we're gonna look at some of the research on connection. So let's jump in. So connection, um, there's a neuroscientist at UCLA, Matthew Lieberman, who described connection as a superpower because it makes us smarter, happier, and more productive. You know, who, who wouldn't want that, right? That's, that's something we could all use. Um, but it provides benefits far beyond that as well. As I mentioned earlier, it makes us more resilient to cope with stress, which is especially important now as we're going through this pandemic. Connection, it appears to improve the cardiovascular system. It also, there's research that suggests it improves the immune system and the endocrine system. So it just makes our body work better when, when we're in this state of balance and we still feel safe that people are supporting us through uh, difficult times in life. 
And there's an academic researcher at Brigham Young University who I've had the privilege to co-present with at one of our clients in Utah. And uh, Julianne holt Lenstead is her name. Well, uh, Dr. holt Lenstead did a meta-analysis of research around the world on connection versus loneliness, uh, which is, means feeling alone, uh, social isolation, which means you're not around people, and living alone. And what she found, it made headlines in the news worldwide. What she found was that those people who had supportive relationships and connection in their life, they were associated with a 50% reduced risk of early death. So it, it makes sense too, when you look at all this research that connection is not only gonna affect how we feel and how productive we are, but it's also going to affect our lifespan. So other research shows that when we have connection, uh, a lack of connection in uh, groups that, I'm sorry, when we have connection in groups that they make fewer mistakes. Now, uh, the chancellor mentioned that one of our clients is Turner Construction. They happen to be the firm that did the uh, TCU stadium expansion recently. And for them, their number one priority is to not have accidents or to make mistakes because it can be a matter of life or death when you're working in construction projects. We also do a lot of work in healthcare and um, reducing mistakes and accidents is uh, you know, extremely high priority. And you see that groups that have connection, have a higher connection, they make fewer uh, mistakes and they experience fewer accidents. So where connection is a superpower, disconnection is a super stressor. Here's why. As Katie mentioned, when we have a lack of connection in our life, sufficient connection that our body needs, the weight, the pain of stressors is greater. We feel it more. We're, in other words, we're more vulnerable to stressors is how researchers describe it. We're also Mike, more likely to have an intense reaction to negatives. And you know, you, I, I imagine you've experienced this, that if you're feeling stressed, you're just quicker to snap at people, right? I know that's so true with me. And I, I just, uh, my patience isn't uh, as long. And so we're likely to say things that we'll regret and that hurt our relationships. Also, it impairs our cognitive function. So we don't think clearly. Our thinking is fuzzier and not as rational. It also makes us, a lack of connection makes us more likely to feel a sense of helplessness and threatened. And that also you know, makes us kind of pull back from society and from relationships just to self-protect. As Katie mentioned, the lack of sufficient connection also undermines our quality of sleep. So we're not as well rested and that affects our energy. And it also spills over to affect our self-control so that we're more likely to not eat healthy foods, you know, go for that Ben and Jerry's in my case, um, or, you know, high, high fat, high calorie, things are much more attractive. And we're also less likely to be active and exercise. So that also affects our health and how we feel. We see from research on groups that disconnection and undermines task performance. So the quality of work that groups does is less. It, um, it has an over 80% effect on reducing trust and cooperation and a greater than 50% effect on declining project, uh, reducing project success. So when you look at all these other factors that you kind of connect the dots, you can see that connection really undermines our performance as individuals Disconnection. Disconnection undermines our performance as individuals and when we're working in groups. So this is a, a definition of connection that I really liked. It was written by Brene Brown. And I just want to read it and comment on a little bit of it. So Dr. Brown describes it as connection as the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard and valued, when they can give and receive judge, uh, without judgment, and when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. Now, there's, this is a very rich description of connection. First of all, I want to point out that connection creates energy. You know, it energizes us and it gives us energy to do more in life and to feel and enjoy life more. And you see in that second line that it's based on, I, I feel seen, I'm not invisible, <laughs> that I feel heard, my, uh, I have a voice, and that I feel valued. And then notice in the next line that these interactions that create connection are um, 
you know, they, the interactions are without judgment. We're not judging one another. And that's especially important. And then finally, that it creates, it derives, uh, we derive sustenance and strength, which is another way to say it makes us more resilient. So there's a lot in that definition. Now, in our work, we mostly work with groups, whether it's uh, organizations or just a wide variety of organizations over the years. And we define connection in the context of a group this way, that connection, it's a positive bond that is based on three factors, shared identity, you know, how are there things we share, like we're all part of the Horn Frog family, that's one aspect of our identity, shared empathy, do we attune to each other's emotions, so that if you're having a bad day, I ask you, I sense that, and I ask you about that, or if something good happens in your life, that I feel a sense of joy for you, and we celebrate that together, shared empathy connects us, and also, do we have a shared understanding, if we're working together in the context of a group, that might mean, you know, where are we going? Why is it important to get there? How are we going to get there? What's my role? <laughs> and things like that. The shared understanding that's created, the shared empathy, and the shared identity have the effect of connecting us and creating this bond that moves individuals toward what we call group-centered membership, where we pull together, we cooperate, we coordinate, we help each other. You have an analogy about dogs. Oh, yes. Uh, we like to say that um, connection is the force that transforms a dog-eat-dog -dog culture into a sled dog team that pulls together. And um, connection is a force, and we definitely see that in the research. So we define disconnection as anything less than that positive bond, because it is not good for us to live without that positive bond. That's what we see in the research. So it's not just the opposite of connection, but it's the absence of that positive bond, the absence of connection. So early on when we started uh, focusing on this topic, which was almost 20 years ago, we started studying connection. We first did research to see what's out there that you know people that scholars have learned about connection. And we, um, our book has all our sources. So if you, or you could always email us, which we'll give you your email at the end. If you have any questions about our sources, we'd be glad to share them with you. And we boiled it down to, in the context of a, a group working together, that there are seven universal human needs that help us thrive in this context. And the first is respect. And I think of it this way, when we first join a group, they don't really know us. And so they haven't had a chance to see what we can do or how we affect the group. But at a minimum, we expect them that they'll respect us. If they're uh, disrespectful in some way, they look down on us, they're passive aggressive, you know, they're intentionally ignoring us, then it makes us angry and we can't do our best work without that. But if people are respectful and we're in the group longer, then we've had a chance to show what we can do. And we expect that people will start to recognize that we're doing good work and we're making positive contributions to the group. And if nobody says anything, we start to wonder, we start to get a little insecure. It's like, does anybody see that I'm doing all this work to help the group? But if people affirm us, then that gives us energy. And then as we're there, a part of the group for longer, we start to develop friendships. We, have, get, we build these relationships with people who have our back and whose backs we have. It has to go both ways for that sense of connection to really develop. And it's a good thing when we have those relationships, including friendships in the workplace. And then when it comes to tasks, we need the autonomy, the freedom to do our work. If we have a micromanaging boss or we're subject to a lot of bureaucracy, then it's hard to really stretch and, and show what we can do. And that holds us back. And that can be frustrating too. Uh, the next task mastery need is um, personal growth. And that just simply means that we're in a role in the group that's a good fit with our strengths. And it provides the right degree of challenge. It's not over challenging so that we're really stressed out or it's not under challenging so that we're bored, but it hits that sweet spot of challenge so that we sense a, a, a sense of connection develops to our work and the hours fly by because we just are so immersed in our work. And that's good. It produces positive emotions when we experience that. And then the next need is meaning that we're, we're doing work that we know is important in some way. And so, you know, we see that just in the work that, uh, you know, you look at what TCU is doing in terms of producing students that 
really make contributions to the world. That's very meaningful. And we'll get into that in, in just a minute. And then finally, we need to see progress. If we don't, you know, if meaning is there, but we're not making progress, we're just spinning our wheels, then that's very discouraging. And that, that affects us too. But when we see progress, we become even more connected to each other and to the work that we're doing together. So when these needs are met, people describe it as I feel connected to my colleagues and I feel connected to the work that we're doing together, that it's meaningful and making a difference in the world. Okay. Another thing that we found in doing research is that there are three types of relational cultures that you need to be aware of. And um, I'd like you to think about, um, well, let me say it this way. Mike and I are often talking with people about connection in the context of the workplace. But what we're discussing today is really uh, applicable to any group that you're in could be your group project in class, uh, could be a committee, your department, a, a club, maybe a family. So uh, when you look at the predominant attitudes, language, and behaviors in a group, and you think about them as they relate to the seven universal human needs that Mike just went through, it'll become clear what kind of a culture it is. Is it a culture that connects people or is it a culture that disconnects people? So the three types of cultures. The first is a culture of control. Now, as you would guess, in a culture of control, those who have the power are ruling over the rest. And it may be that a leader is behaving a bit like a dictator. I hope not. It could be that a leader is a, a micromanager and that feels very stifling and controlling. Um, so a culture of control, how does it feel to be, to be in a group like that? Well, you might feel um, micromanaged. You might feel hyper-criticized. You might feel unsafe or helpless in, in some way. And this kind of a culture breeds an environment of fear. You know, people feel, um, you know, afraid to make a mistake or take a risk. They might feel afraid to speak up, offer their perspective, especially if they know that the controlling person doesn't want to hear bad news, doesn't want to hear an opinion that's contrary to what she holds, he holds. And when you have an environment like that, then there's a higher probability that important information and perspectives that need to get to a decision maker are not going to surface and suboptimal decisions are gonna be made. And it's really hard to be creative and innovative when you're in a culture of control and you feel like your voice isn't welcome. So the second type of culture is a culture of indifference. And here, you know, it's often that people are just so busy that they fail to take the time to develop and sustain those healthy and supportive uh, relationships in the group. And how does it feel to be on the receiving end of indifference? Well, you might feel like you're just a cog in the machine, underappreciated, um, unimportant, maybe invisible. And there are, there's a common feature that we see in both of these types of cultures, cultures of disconnection, and that is a focus on tasks and a neglecting or discounting of relationships. And when this happens, people are gonna feel lonely. Now we can be pretty good at masking our loneliness, but as Mike has already mentioned, loneliness is a, more of a pervasive issue than you might realize. You know, If three out of five American adults self-reported as lonely before the pandemic, imagine what that number might be like right now. And when so many of our interactions with each other are uh, virtual, it can be harder to tell how somebody is really doing. So we want to watch out for loneliness. So I would say that uh, a common reaction to being in a culture of disconnection is that people are going to begin to pull back, you know, self-protect, participate less, um, not offer their opinions if they can tell that they're really not 
wanted. So let's talk about something better. Let's talk about a culture of connection because that's the kind of culture that you want to be in. No surprise. In a culture of connection, people care about people, one another. They care about the work that they are doing together. In a culture of connection, there they will feel connected to the leader. They will feel connected to one another. And this uh, engenders this wonderful sense of community and unity that's very inclusive and energizing. And when people feel like they have a voice and they're actively contributing, then this marketplace of ideas forms that really sparks productivity and innovation. So you want to be placing yourself uh, in a culture of connection, or if you have a position of leadership or influence, seeing that connection is what the culture is all about. So one uh, quick story we wanted to share was of Riley Kiltz, and maybe some of you have met Riley. He's a former TCU student. And I met Riley when, when he was at TCU as a student, and he was leading a group on campus called Ignite. And I mentored him and helped develop his leadership team's culture. And Riley had a great experience at TCU. He felt extremely connected to other students, to faculty and staff. And it really had an impact on him, just the culture of connection at TCU. He got an offer to join a very prestigious firm. And when he, after he graduated from TCU, he worked for them for three years. And oftentimes he felt lonely and he knew that wasn't a good thing. And so he stuck it out for three years and he ended up raising some money on the side from friends and family and starting, started a company called Craftwork. Uh, which is a specialty coffee and co-working um, space organization. And the mission of Craftwork is to, to create spaces and places where people experience connection and community. So here's a great example of just a student at TCU who experienced a culture of connection, and it had such an impact on him that now he is bringing it to the greater world. And I, uh, Craftwork is based in Fort Worth, and they're also in Austin. They plan to spread throughout Texas and hopefully beyond. But here's a great example of just the impact that a culture of connection can have on an individual, so much so that they want to bring it to other places, you know, in other contexts, whether it's their family, their community, or in Riley's case, also through his business, creating connection and community. So I want to share a, a little bit about our work and a model that's relevant to you as an individual, but also relevant to groups. And what we have found is, and this is so true of me, I love to make lists and I, I feel so good when I cross things off my list. So I'm very task oriented. And, you know, historically, I'll tell you the truth, I didn't value relationships as much as I, I should have. I didn't realize I was hardwired to connect and, and that I needed that. And it had an effect on me. It affected my, I started burning out because I was so focused on tasks and I had to take some time off and and really discover that what I was missing was I was just a task chivaholic. <laughs> and um, we thrive when we develop excellence in a task through our work, but also relationship excellence, which is all about connection. And that combination is important to achieve a high level of performance for a sustained period of time. This is true for groups, it's true for organizations, it's true for individuals. Because if you're just focused on tasks all the time and it squeezes out relationships, then you're going to dysfunction and you're not, you're gonna be in that state of stress response that we talked about and it'll undermine your performance. And if you have an organization where the entire organization doesn't really dis isn't uh, doesn't have that need for connection met, that organization is going to dysfunction. So that's what we found in our research. As we dug deeper into what was driving this connection and task excellence, we boiled it down to three factors that we call vision, value, voice, and you can see it in the blue arrows in this diagram. So let me go just a little bit deeper on these three core elements of a connection culture. So vision, first of all, exists when people in the group are motivated by the mission, united by the values, and proud of the reputation. So TCU is a great example. 
You know, an organization that has a vision to be a world-class value-centered university with a mission to educate individuals to think and act as ethical leaders and responsible citizens in the global community. And I think all of us who are a part of the Horn Frog family, we feel a real sense of pride about the, what, what's going on at TCU, how it's having a positive impact on students who are changing the world after they leave TCU. So this is, you know, TCU has a very inspiring vision. The second element is value, which means that people are valued. So we define it as when people in the group or everyone in the group understands the needs of people, that's the seven needs that I talked about earlier, um, appreciates the positive, unique contributions of others, and they help others achieve potential. So you see they're appreciating through um, providing recognition and affirmation of people for their character strengths and their uh, competencies. And they're also going beyond that to look for ways to help them where everybody is helping each other. It's wonderful to be in a culture like that. It just helps you be your best. And then the last element is voice. And that exists when everyone in the group, they seek the ideas of others, share their ideas and opinions honestly, and safeguard relational connections. So seek the ideas of others reflects humility, shows we don't think we have a monopoly on good ideas, Sharing ideas and opinions honestly shows candor, or honesty in the culture that we, sh we share what we really think rather than what we think the other person just wants to hear. And then finally, when there are a lot of conversations, we can say things that hurt, we can say things that come out the wrong way and that hurt other people's feelings. So we're sensitive to that and are quick to repair those relationships if we've done something to offend somebody. And we're also a quick to quick to assume the best in others and forgive them if they have said something that hurt our feelings. So vision, value, voice, it's, it's very simple, but profound. And what we have found in our research is that when a group has vision, value, voice, and a sense of connection, number one, they have a cognitive advantage. They think more clearly, they're better at decision makers, more creative. Secondly, they're more engaged. They give more effort because they have that enthusiasm. They want to give more effort. They're aligned with the group so that everybody is moving in the same direction. They, um, the decisions that are made are better because there's better communication when people share information rather than withhold it. And they engage in creative conversations that fuels innovation and creates new and better ways of doing things. And then finally, when that connection exists, people are, they pull together. And that just means they're, they're more agile and adaptable so that when external opportunities develop, they can pursue them quicker. And if external threats develop, they can respond to them quicker to protect the interests of the group. And so these are all six different advantages from connection that are distinct. And together they add up to a powerful source of performance advantage or competitive advantage, if you wanna think of that, if you're in a competitive marketplace. Okay. Time for breakout number two. So in this one, we've covered all sorts of material in this section, and we want to have you think about your own connection story in this 15 minute breakout session that you'll go into. So share an example of when you felt connected to an individual or a group and what made you feel that way? You know, was it something to do with, um, one of the core elements of a connection culture, vision or value or voice. Um, how, how did it relate to those seven universal human needs that uh, we've spoken about? So those are some things to kind of stir your thinking. So enjoy uh, breakout session number two. And when you come back, we're gonna dive into some very practical things that you can be doing um, this week to boost your connection and your resilience. So um, we'll see you in a little bit. Okay, welcome back everyone. All right, let's go to our next section where we talk about some applications some things you can put in place. So first of all, you can't give what you don't have. Now you're probably wondering what in the world does that mean? And it basically means that if we don't have enough connection in our life and some of those resilience practices, then we're not gonna have great emotional health. And when we don't feel well, our emotions are not positive, 
then we're not going to be good connectors. We're going to be grumpy, more moody, and we just don't tend to be good at connecting. So step one is self-care is extremely important. And so we need to make sure that we have enough connection and resilience in our life to carry that stress load. If you think back to Atlas that we talked about earlier. Okay. And I wanted to throw something into the, the self-care idea, and that is um, let the tears out. Um, I learned recently that we have three types of tears, um, basal tears. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, the protein rich antibacterial liquid that our tear ducts secrete that keeps our eyes moist every time we blink. We have reflex tears. Uh, these are the tears that uh, are released when something gets in our eye, you know, you're walking across campus on a windy day, or you're chopping onions, and there's an irritant, and our eyes start to flush that out. So those types of tears have health benefits for our eyes. And then we have this third type of tear, and that's an emotional tear. And these tears are triggered by uh, strong emotions that we're feeling, you know, whether it's a, a positive or a negative, and these tears kind of flow from our eyes. And um, I would say to you as a mom and as a friend, let them out. You know, sometimes uh, it's, it's not the right moment to have that emotional cry, but if you routinely find yourself suppressing your tears because you think it's a sign of weakness, then you're gonna be missing out on some of the benefits that researchers have discovered about these emotional tears. So for instance, uh, a study in 2014 found that uh, emotional crying activates our parasympathetic nervous system. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. And that uh, m helps the body to relax. Um, according to the Cleveland Eye Clinic, scientists have found traces of stress chemicals in these emotional tears. And that seems to indicate that when we are shedding these tears, we are uh, relieving some of the stress in our bodies. And it also activates, um, it, it has our bodies produce endorphins, a feel good chemical. Mm -hmm. So um, interesting to think about what's going on in those kind of tears. So um, go ahead and let them out. You know, sometimes having a good cry is just what you need to do. Um, I mean, we're dealing with a lot of change and stress these days. So let them out. Okay, another practice is to never worry alone. And bad things happen when we worry alone. And it's just the way our brain works. When we try to process our worries on our own, then brain function tends to reside in a part of the brain called the amygdala where we process threats. And there's a, a disconnection to the cortex where we make rational decisions. So to counteract that, all we have to do is process our worries with someone. And I do this with Katie. If I'm worried about something, I'll sit down with Katie and just say, hey, I'm concerned about this. And we just start talking. And that has the effect of disconnecting the amygdala and engaging the cortex. It's almost like a teeter-totter. When one's engaged, the other is disengaged. So by getting into that conversation, the brain activity moves to the cortex where rational thought resides. So the bottom line is when we worry, if we process it with someone else, we feel better, it calms our nervous system, and we make better decisions because we're using that cortex of the brain where we make rational decisions. At TCU, you have a lot of resources to uh, tap if you have concerns. And these are just some of them. You're actually going to receive an email that will uh, lay out contact information for some of these resources. So it may be you have friends back home or family members or uh, best friends at school that you could process with, but it never hurts to also take advantage of some of these resources that are at TCU. Um, when you're worried and have concerns, it'll just help you make better decisions and you'll feel better. Another practice that we like is on a weekly basis, just processing your week with someone to share your highs and lows. And sometimes you hear people call it, you know, my praises and prayer requests might be one way to call it, but just wait uh, to kind of review the week. Maybe it's over a meal 
to share. Here's some highlights of my week, and here's some things I'm, I'm really concerned about. And that's a great way to connect and just help you process what's happened during the week, which will, as I said, make you feel better and help you make better decisions. Okay. So one of the things that you can do that's really helpful for resilience is to pause daily for gratitude. So Mike and I love to stay up on current events. You know, we're reading newspapers and articles and we're sitting down in front of the PBS news hour and talking about, you know, big things over dinner. And it's very stimulating. And uh, depending on the day, it can also be a lot, a, a little, a little overwhelming. <laughs> so I have found during the pandemic that if I will stop and think about the beautiful and wonderful things that are going on in life, that helps to kind of reorient my mindset back to the positive and optimistic. So I share with you a few on the screen. I am grateful for my family, Mike, our daughter, Sarah, her husband, Jeremy, their daughter, Peyton. I am thankful for our daughter, Elizabeth. I am thankful for bright colors and spring flowers that emerge after a cold and <laughs> barren winter here in the Northeast. I am thankful for a bowl, a, a cup of bold coffee, several cups of coffee <laughs> during the day. And every day needs chocolate. Who is with me? Who is with me on that? Love, I'm grateful for, for chocolate. Um, I'm grateful for uh, the people who have, who have been able to adapt and and think out of the box during the pandemic. We were scheduled to go to California to film a course for LinkedIn Learning. And that was of course canceled because of COVID and our LinkedIn Learning team uh, figured out, you know, how we were gonna make this happen. Shipped us all this fantastic equipment, <laughs> walked us through how to set it up, directed us remotely from where they amazing. were in California. Yeah. And here, here we are in our, you know, there's a picture of Mike mm -hmm. in our little studio there. <laughs> in the library. Um, I'm grateful for outdoor spaces like our front porch, where we can have a socially distanced time to be with people. You know, I think it's great. Some of the things that TCU is doing. I love seeing pictures of all the outdoor seating that was put on the campus <laughs> commons in the fall. I thought that was brilliant. You know, I really like the idea of landing zones where Students, you can mm -hmm. get out of your dorm room and come to this designated spot somewhere on campus or mm -hmm. come back to campus from your off-campus housing and just be around other people while you're doing your you know, remote virtual classes. Um, so I, I applaud that. Um, this pausing daily for gratitude, you know, it might be thinking of things before you climb out of bed in the morning or while you're brushing your teeth at night. Maybe it's thinking while you're walking to class or to a meeting. Some people like to keep a gratitude journal and they write in it once a week. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that studies over the past two decades have consistently found that people who practice gratitude um, have report fewer symptoms of illness, including depression. They have, uh, they are more optimistic, um, more happiness. They have stronger relationships. They have more generous behaviors among other benefits. So uh, part of this resiliency, count your blessings. All right, next slide. Okay, uh, here's another one. Be kind and encouraging. Oh, this looks like a group of people who are gonna fall in love with TCU as they go around <laughs> with uh, an orientation person. Yes, go frogs. <laughs> so um, maybe you've heard of the positivity ratio. This is something that uh, psychologist John Gottman uh, has come out with. He's observed uh, married couples. And as he watched them, he identified that uh, the couples who were less likely their marriage to survive had this positivity ratio of five to one during times of conflict. So that was five positive interactions for every one negative. Now, couples that had staying power in watching them just in their normal day-to-day, -day, their positivity ratio was more like 20 to one, 20 positives <laughs> for each one negative. So uh, some of these positive things can be very small and simple. So try these out mm -hmm. on people around you. Um, smiling, saying, hey, 
uh, as you're as you're passing by on um, in a hallway, um, using learning and using someone's name in a conversation, um, turning toward mm -hmm. the person who is speaking to you. You know, your body position um, is one of those positive things. Uh, when you enter a room, be it a real actual room or a virtual room, saying hi, or when you're leaving, you know, saying bye. If you don't do something that simple, it could come off as indifference to someone who is really sensitive about that. Mm -hmm. So there are some very simple things um, that you can do that are positives. Another thing is to um, be present. Okay, this is about giving your full attention to the other person, um, listening carefully, observing the facial expressions, the body language, um, maybe asking questions, asking clarifying questions. This is also about not sneaking a look at your mm. smartphone or um, letting your mind wander or, you know, looking around the room, mm -hmm. you know, th these things kind of break that that sense of connection. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I'll say about this slide would be um, attuning to other people's emotions. And I, Mike talked about this a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Mutual empathy is a really powerful connector. And we have the ability to do that because we've got these mirror neurons in our brain. You know, it's fascinating how complex and, you know, what our bodies do often when without our even you know, knowing what's going on. But so these mirror neurons, they act like an emotional Wi-Fi. So if uh, we're with someone and they um, are expressing their positive emotion and we can attune to that, it, it enhances their positive emotion that they're feeling. If, if they are expressing a negative or a sad emotion and we can attune to that, it helps to diminish the pain that they're feeling. Mm -hmm. So your roommate, studied so hard for that exam. And she comes back and she's like, oh, I got an A. And you like pop up out of your desk, out of your chair, and you do a happy dance with her. Okay, I know that's embarrassing, <laughs> but you know, join in her celebration. Or maybe it did go very well. And you sit down on the bed next to her and you just listen and um, acknowledge that what, how she's feeling. And yeah, I'm sorry that, that that grade didn't come out the way you were hoping. I know you studied so hard and, and it must be really discouraging. Mm -hmm. So I know often we're like, we wanna jump in with a positive thing like, oh, next time you'll, it'll be better. Sometimes we just need to sit with someone in the emotion that they're feeling and then bring a positive. Um, to that. So those are my thoughts about being kind and encouraging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, another practice is um, just serving each other, uh, looking for ways to serve. And we, Katie found this on the TCU website, and we love what Serena wrote here just about how connected she felt to others while she was serving alongside other um, you know, members of the student body and, and probably faculty and staff at TCU. So take a look at that when you get a chance. So serving, um, I have a mentor who, believe it or not, believe it or not, this is true. She's 105 years old. Her name is Frances Hesselbein. She's actually on Twitter, if you can believe that. I know. I see some reactions <laughs> out there. So she, uh, Frances's handle, uh, her Twitter handle is to serve is to live. And she has really demonstrated that her entire life. She used to be the CEO of the Girl Scouts. And then she was leader of a, a leadership development uh, firm. She's uh, well known in leadership circles for her wisdom. And it's so true that when we help others in some way, we benefit because it produces what's been described as helpers high. It, it produces positive emotions that just make us more resilient. So little things, you know, writing thank you notes to people, notes of encouragement, reaching out to um, a family member who may be alone, uh, just to express your appreciation for them, you know, dropping off a gift to someone, um, just little things like that can make a big difference. And they have a positive effect on us. So uh, connecting so that we learn from others who are different than we are. There's a real richness in life when we take the time to connect with others who are different in some way. And one of our colleagues, uh, 
RDR training in Chicago, they developed these five obstacles to connecting where differences exist. And so the difference may be, you know, a gender difference. It may be a uh, racial difference. It may be uh, extroverts are different than introverts. So there's all kinds of differences that can kind of get in the way in, of connection. And so our, our friends, they came up with five obstacles to connecting where differences exist and five competencies to overcome those obstacles. And I'm going to cover this very quickly. You can always go to their website and learn much more. We think it's great work. Number one, have you ever heard of the phrase, uh, birds of a, a feather flock together, right? We have that tendency as human beings too, that we feel most comfortable with people who are just like us. And, um, but, but, we don't learn and grow as much. We just learn new perspectives when we connect with people who have lived in different parts of the world or have um, just different experiences in life. So there's a lot of wisdom and not flocking entirely, but being proactive about networking and connecting with people who are different in some way. The second obstacle is cultural naivety. And that just means that we, we haven't got to know someone who lives in a different culture. And so we can be insensitive. We may say or do or think the things that um, are painful or hurtful to them in some way. But as we get to know them, we can be more sensitive to make adjustments so that we don't do things that are, are hurtful to them. And that's related to what's called monocultural culturalism. And that simply means that everything has to, we insist that everything is done according to our culture. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I grew up in the Midwest, for example, and my family, we were, you know, very meat and potatoes type family. So we never had Thai food or, you know, we had Italian food, but uh, there are a lot of uh, ethnic foods that we never tried. And I discovered a lot of those in college and after college. Um, so, Monoculturalism means, you know, we instead of being just insisting that everything's done according to our culture, that we, as we learn more about other cultures, we can make adjustments, we can calibrate so that we don't do things that are painful to others. And so that it's kind of related to point two, they're very similar. A pejorative just behavior just means that uh, you know, uh, racial or slurs in some way, people are being put down in some way. When we're, when we hold back and we were indifferent, in a sense, we're, it can be perceived as we're approving that. And so it's important that we really step up and protect others when they're being demeaned or devalued because of some difference they have. And then finally, our, the way our brains are wired is that we, perceive differences as threats oftentimes. And so we need to counter affect that. And the way we can overcome the, that way our brain works is to just expect the best in others. So we can consciously think that way and it helps overcome that tendency we have. And that, you know, we call that positive expectancy. So these are five practices that help us connect with others. And I just find that as I connect with people who are different, I always learn something that's rich about just their experiences in life or new ways of thinking that help me. So I would encourage everyone to do that. All right. It's time for a final breakout. <laughs> uh, this will be another 15 minutes. And um, I have been neglecting to say, which I imagine you've all been doing, is make sure that everybody has a voice, that everybody is getting an opportunity to um, share and speak in these times together. Um, you know, I love hearing other people's mm -hmm. ideas and perspectives. So let's be sure everyone has, um, you know, time to shine and, mm -hmm. and contribute. So final topic is, um, you know, which of these practices that we've raced through uh, resonated with you the most? Uh, and what connection or resilience practice could you embrace and implement uh, next week? Or even let's start it this week. So uh, one final chat time. And then when uh, we all come back, we've got a few kind of closing thoughts and um, about what the future looks like in terms of connection post pandemic. So we'll see you in 15. Okay, well, welcome back everyone. Now we're in the last section, connection going forward. And we'll just wrap up here in a minute. Um, how about connection after the pandemic? When things start to get back to normal, 
Oh, I see a bunch of you are just coming back, back now. There's a little uh, bit of a delay jumped, there. Jump okay. the gun for a moment. Start, start again, Mike. Okay. Okay. So how about connection after the pandemic? What are some things we should be thinking about? And we'll wrap it up here briefly. So after the pandemic, what we're going to find, and we know this from studying, say, astronauts who have been in isolation for a while, or explorers, when they first come back, their brain has adjusted to not being around as many people. And when they're around larger groups of people, they may feel a little anxiety. It just takes a while for our brains to get reacclimated to being around so many people if we've been away from them for a while. So just something to expect when eventually this uh, pandemic ends, which it will. And then we expect that people are going to experience post-traumatic growth. Oftentimes, we grow during times of adversity. And, you know, society, I think we're going to see a lot of benefits that come out of just the massive research. But also, we're expecting to see a greater appreciation for connection and relationships because we've gone without that to a large degree during the time of the pandemic. So when you think about the effects of connection, that could have a huge positive impact on society. So we're very optimistic that coming out of this, there's going to be post-traumatic growth for all of us, and we're going to value relationships more going forward than we did in the past. So in our work, we also think about people as falling into three categories when it comes to connection in general. Now, the first are the intentional disconnectors. <laughs> and, um, you know, just pause and think about that for a minute. You know, do you know any intentional disconnectors? Well, I hope you don't. They're, they're only about 1% of the population or less. And psychiatrists call them the dark triad. They're sociopaths, narcissists, and Machiavellians. And the one thing they have in common is they're unable to attune to others' emotions, so they can't empathize. You know, many of them end up in jail, and um, they are lonely. They also don't tend to have long lifespans. So, like I said, they're only a small part of the population. So, something to be aware of, though, in case you run into them, because you have to be careful. Most of us fall into a second category, which is unintentional disconnectors. We just have habits or blind spots that hold us back when it comes to connecting with others. So we need um, mentors in our life and people who care enough to tell us about our blind spots. And that helps us grow to become intentional connectors. And that's when we really have an impact on the people around us, on society, and live more joyous lives. So we have covered some of our material today, some of our content and the work we do. There's so much more in our book, Connection Culture, that's available on Amazon. And you can also go to our website, connectionculture.com. And oh, go back to the book for a minute, oh, Mike. Okay, Katie. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to say, um, you know, one of the things that we've loved doing about the book is um, broadening the diversity of leaders and the types of groups that really are doing connection um, well, doing connection right. Because I think we, we learn so much from seeing what other people are doing. You know, how are they using vision or value or voice? What does that look like that I could apply in my setting? So we start out with a profile of Lin-Manuel Miranda and his key collaborators who came up with this groundbreaking musical, Hamilton. Uh, we have Angela Merkel, who's the chancellor of Germany. Uh, we have TCU, let's just say, <laughs> and Chancellor Boschini, one of the on best TCU. connectors we know. <laughs> uh, we love shining the light on TCU. Mm -hmm. Let's tell the world all the great things that you are doing about connection. Um, there's all sorts of relevant research, you know, about biology and and groups and employee engagement and things uh, with all the sources. So you can, you know, follow up on things even more deeply if you want to, you know, go over the connection culture model and tons of practical applications, uh, actions that you can take. And we worked in a lot of reflection and application material. So it's not just like words you're reading on the page, but what does this, how does it relate to me and what I can be doing to be in a culture of connection and to be that intentional connector. Because really when you're, mm -hmm. you're in that connection culture, it's gonna be inclusive and energizing and just this richness of being able to contribute and spark 
productivity and innovation. So, okay, I just wanted to say mm -hmm. a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. We have touched on things today, but there's so much more that I think that you'll enjoy if you do dig into the book. And if you email us, we'd be glad to send you a sample chapter that includes the story of Lynn manuel Miranda and his collaborators that developed Hamilton. It's one of our favorites. So, but as Katie said, there's so much more. Um, the former chief of the U.S. Navy, Steph Curry, and the Golden State Warriors. So it's just really interesting to see how so many different diverse individuals have cultivated connection and it's had a positive impact on their lives and those around them, including in the workplace. So we also, you can contact us. Um, we'd be happy to connect with any of you. We love connecting with uh, faculty, students, staff at TCU. And here's how you can reach us. Very simple, Mike or Katie at connectionculture.com. And like we said, we have a lot of material on our, on our website that's available for free and we would love to be of help. So uh, we hope that you'll mark this day, begin, being intentional about connecting and just watch what happened. You'll experience greater productivity, greater creativity, and most important, greater joy that comes from having an abundance of connection in your life. So thank you all for being with us this afternoon. And um, we hope when the pandemic is over that we get a chance to meet you on campus. So uh, all the best to you and go frogs. Oh, go frogs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Bye -bye.